I'm Jamie Buckingham. Shalom from Israel. In this brief study on how to use spiritual authority, we're going to look at some specific instances in the life of Jesus where he took authority over evil. We're also going to see what the Bible has to say about the authority God has given to us. For too long, God's people have been kicked around by Satan. We've listened to the news broadcasts of war and said there's nothing we can do. Uh, we've heard the doctor's reports and surrendered to disease as our inevitable fate. We've said, well, uh, others may have enough faith to overcome Satan, but I'm too weak or too ignorant. In today's study, I'm going to take you to one of the most mysterious places on earth, a place called Banyas near old Caesarea Philippi. One afternoon, Jesus brought his disciples to this spring and told them that spiritual authority over Satan was not just his. It belonged to all believers. Everything Jesus did had purpose, including bringing his disciples to this place, a place called Banyas, near the old city of Caesarea Philippi. Today, this is a very popular gathering spot for Jews, especially on Shabbat, as it is today, where they come and enjoy the springs and have their musical concerts. Back then, it was an entirely different situation. It was a strange place then, a place to which Jews seldom came. It was outside the region of Herod Antipas, under the Syrian rule of Herod's brother Philip. The principal city was named Caesarea for Caesar and Philippi for Philip the Tetrarch. This spring, known as the headwaters of the Jordan River, had special significance. The Greeks believed their god Pan, the god of nature, a half man, half goat, was born in this cave. In fact, for centuries, the place was called Panius. However, the locals could not pronounce Panius, and so they called it Banius, the name which still appears on the Israel maps today. Far north of Jewish influence, it was a hotbed for false gods. This was Gentile territory, a stronghold for the ancient gods of Syria, Greece, and Rome. Scattered around this place are the ruins of 14 different temples to Baal, where temple prostitutes and sometimes child sacrifice took place. Not too far from here was a great temple of white marble built by Herod the Great, Philip's father, to honor Caesar as God. This entire area reeked of ancient religions, and it was here, under the shadows of the gods of Syria, Greece, and Rome, that this homeless, penniless carpenter brought his disciples to ask them the most significant question of all time, deliberately setting himself against the backdrop of these world's religions. Jesus demanded that his disciples compare him with all of them. This was Jesus' final exam in his course of comparative religions of the world. Who do you say that I am, he asked. It was Peter, the fisherman from Galilee, who answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Greek word Christos is the same as the Hebrew word Messiah. Both mean the anointed one. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, Jesus answered. This was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father, which was in heaven. His answer, straight from God, was revelation knowledge. He then calls Simon by a new name, Petra, which is the Greek word for rock. You are now a rock, and on this rock I build my church. There's been all kinds of interpretations of what Jesus meant when he said that. Roman Catholics believe one thing, most Protestants believe another. But putting all that aside, let's look at what else he said. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. When Jesus used the term church, he was not referring to church as we know it today, not to a building, not to an ecclesiastical organization. The Greek word for church was the word ekklesia. Ekklesia was a group of men which had been called out of the city and given special authority. The word literally means the called out ones. These called out ones were the elders of the city, the, the city fathers. They had been elected or appointed and given authority to run uh, the city. Their meeting place was the gates of the city. Ancient city gates were far more than a door in the wall. Bordered on each side by high parapets, they were elaborately constructed to defend the city against attackers. 
A good example is the Damascus Gate in the old city of Jerusalem. First you come to an outer gate, then once through the gate you enter into an S-shaped antechamber which could be closed off by a series of other gates. While the enemy might batter down the outside gate, there was no room inside for a battering ram. You find the same kind of construction at the Jaffa Gate, which is one of the main gates into the old city of Jerusalem. In peacetime, the gate area was used for two purposes. It was the center of trade, and all legal decisions of banking and commerce were made there. This area was also the meeting area for the ecclesia, the city fathers. It was the seat of authority and dominion. Thus, when Jesus told Peter, when your church is going to have authority over the gates of hell, he was not talking about going to hell and kicking in the gates. He was, he was talking about authority, about dominion. He was talking about the world, Satan's government, could not overcome the authority of the church, that God's people had dominion over all the world's systems and over all of Satan's legions. What a powerful promise Jesus gave to his church at that time. Now, Banyas is a popular gathering place for Israelis, but then it was a place of pagan worship. Now we understand the promise that Jesus gave to his church at this place. It was not just for popes and bishops and priests and pastors. No, that authority belongs to every believer, from the smallest child to the oldest saint. We are the church, and we have full authority over Satan's government today. Why don't you exercise that authority over Satan? Jesus has given it to you. Take it. I'm Jamie Buckingham, Shalom from Israel. The more I walk with God, the more I realize the ultimate importance of prayer. I grew up praying, started with my mother teaching me, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And then in Sunday school, I learned the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven. My dad bowed his head before every meal and prayed out loud, thanking God for the food. But there's a difference I've discovered in saying prayers and in praying. Praying is not only talking to God, it's listening to what God says to us. It's being in his presence, enjoying him, letting him enjoy us. Yes, it can be at a crowded room or church service or even in the back seat of a car. It can be done at a bedside in a hospital or in an instant just before two cars collide for God is always here, waiting to hear from us, wanting us to cry out to him, hoping we'll take spiritual authority. Then there are times when you need to simply withdraw, to get alone. Jesus did that often. Come with me now to the top of a tall mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Here was the place that Jesus used to come and withdraw and pray. Today I am standing on top of Mount Arbel, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Below me is the modern city of Tiberias. Over there to my right, at the north end of this beautiful natural lake, is the ancient city of Capernaum, where Jesus lived the last three years of his life. Just beyond those low mountains is the village of his childhood, Nazareth. Jesus often came up to this lonely place to pray. It was then, as it is today, a quiet spot. Despite its beauty, few people come here because of the difficulty of the climb. Just over this ledge and about halfway down the cliff are the ancient cliff dwellings of the Zealots, 
the Jewish rebels who conducted guerrilla warfare against the Romans in the days of Jesus. In fact, one of his disciples, Simon, belonged to this group. He may have actually lived in that fortress down below before he became a follower of Jesus. I climbed down there yesterday. The cliff dwellings are virtually inaccessible except by going over the precipice as I did. These same zealots, after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, fled to King Herod's magnificent mountain fortress, Masada, overlooking the Dead Sea. There they made a last stand against the Romans. At the end of three years of siege, the Romans finally built a huge ramp up the backside of the mountain. The night before the final siege on the gate, the zealots, one by one, killed their families, then committed suicide, rather than become slaves at the hands of the dreaded Romans. When the Romans finally battered down the gates, their victory was hollow. All the Jews were dead at their own hands. The fall of Masada in 73 AD marked the end of Jewish independence until 1948, when the Jews once again occupied this land of Israel. The Bible says Jesus often withdrew to pray. He was constantly aware of the warfare raging around him in the invisible world. He knew that prayer was the only way to win that war. The devil is still here. His demons are all around us. We can't see them, but they're here just the same. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul tells the Christians to make certain that they dress in the full armor of God so that when the enemy attacks, they will be protected. But we have to do more than dress daily in the armor of God. Most important, Paul says, we are to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and intercessions. Jesus did that when he came to this mountain to pray. One time, Mark writes, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place to pray. Luke talks about the huge crowds which followed Jesus. But Jesus, Luke says, often withdrew to lonely places to pray. One day, Luke writes, Jesus went out into the hills to pray. He spent the entire night up here praying to God. Two things seem to be important to Jesus. One, solitude. Two, prayer. What is prayer? Here's a simple definition. Prayer is talking to God. Prayer is God talking to you. Today's Jews often go to the Western Wall in Jerusalem where they stick written prayers into the cracks. That's a form of prayer, but that's only half of it, for prayer is more than speaking or writing to God. Prayer is also hearing from God. Prayer is not a posture we take as a yoga might take. Prayer is not a formula. Prayer is not repeating certain words, even scriptures. Prayer does not depend on whether you're good or bad, Christian or Jew or heathen. Prayer, prayer is two-way conversation with God. It's the created talking with his creator and God talking back. In the middle of his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, on the slope just north of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus paused, looked at his disciples, and realized that they knew virtually nothing about prayer. They, they knew how to say prayers, but they were ignorant when it came to having conversation with God. So Jesus warned them against babbling like pagans and told them instead of praying long public prayers as the Pharisees did in the synagogue to go into their room, close the door, and talk to God as a child talks to his father. Today, take a few moments, get quiet, talk to your heavenly father, and let him talk to you.
I'm Jamie Buckingham. Shalom from Israel. Have you ever felt like your city or some city where you visited was literally under the control of Satan? The Bible says there are demonic forces assigned by Satan to control certain cities, certain areas of land. When Daniel was in exile in Babylon of Persia, which is now the nation of Iraq, God dispatched an angel to bring him a message. Arriving late, the angel explained to Daniel that on entering the area, he was blocked by an archdemon called the Prince of Persia. He was forced to call on his own archangel, Michael, to force back the demon prince so that he could enter the area. I remember the sense of depression I had when I stepped off the plane years ago in Prague, Czechoslovakia. This was long before I had any knowledge of demon activity. But I, I knew there was at that time something demonic that controlled that city. I felt the same way flying into certain American cities. In this video, I'm standing at one of those places where demon forces used to dwell in great force. It's the ancient Greek region southeast of the Sea of Galilee called the Decapolis. It was here Jesus took authority over more than 6,000 demons. In the autumn of 29 A.D., not far from where I'm standing, Jesus and his disciples gathered at the base of snow-capped Mount Hermon. At 9,102 feet, Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in the Middle East. From its snow-capped summit flows the waters of the Jordan River, the source of both the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, far to the south. Just half a mile to my right is Lebanon. Just beyond the mountain range is Syria. A series of significant events took place right here. It started when Jesus commissioned the twelve, his disciples. Luke recounts that, saying, He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. They returned with stories of marvelous success. And then, a week later, they arrived near here. Jesus took three of his men, James and John and Peter, and they climbed the mountain to a place near the timberline. On the second day, as the men were praying, an incredible thing took place. Jesus' face radically changed. His clothes became as bright as lightning. And as his disciples watched, awestruck, two other men appeared, talking to Jesus. Somehow, his disciples recognized them as Moses and Elijah. Moses had been dead for more than a thousand years. Elijah had died 600 years before. And yet, here they were, talking to Jesus. What wonderful proof that we live on after death. Scared, speechless, the men watched until the apparitions disappeared and Jesus resumed his normal countenance. And only then did Peter stammer out, this is wonderful. Let's build a monument. In fact, let's build three of them and just stay here where the glory is. Not here, Jesus said. Not on this mountain. There's work to do down there in that valley, and the time is short. And so, picking up their things, they descended to a place down there, and suddenly they were caught up in a drama of human need, facing what seemed to be an impossible situation. How typical of us all. One moment we're with God on the mountaintop. The next we're caught up in a swirl of human need, faced with problems that rip at our hearts and send us to the brink of despair. The other disciples, the ones who had been left behind, had gotten embroiled in an argument. Uh, the religious Jews were there. They were talking about demons. Can a man be possessed? If he is afflicted with demons, is he oppressed or obsessed or possessed? What method should you use in exorcising demons? Can, can a child be possessed with demons? Jesus never got embroiled in these arguments. He just cast them out and went on his way. This time, however, must have been especially exasperating. Jesus wanted to be alone he, in a quiet place. He needed to meditate with God. He had just received word from God that he had only a year to live. And shortly, he was going to be tortured and executed in Jerusalem. It was a time he really needed to be quiet and assimilate all he had experienced with God on the Mount of Transfiguration. Instead, here he was, 
thrust into the middle of a silly argument, realizing the men he had been training to take over were powerless. But Jesus never turned away from human need. What's the argument about? He asked. Man stepped forward. My little boy has an evil spirit. He cannot hear, he cannot talk. When the spirit seizes him, falls to the ground, he goes into convulsions, becomes rigid. Sometimes the spirit throws him into the fire. Your disciples have been bragging about how they could cast out demons. So I brought my son here, but they're powerless. It was a sad spectacle. Like many Christians of today, the disciples had held out great hopes. They'd talked of power and authority, but when it came down to being able to do anything, they were helpless. The boy's father, however, was not discouraged. He seemed to know that if he could ever really get to Jesus, that despite the failures, despite the powerlessness of the church, despite the public failure of so many of God's people, d despite the big tell no show of the professional religionist, if he could just get to Jesus, his son would be healed. Jesus recognized the genuineness of the father's heart. And so turning to the child, he spoke to the evil spirit, you deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out. Never enter him again. The demon threw the child to the ground, and then in a horrible screech, he left, and the child was free. Jesus didn't come just to get us to heaven when we die. He came to give us abundant life here on earth, life free from the bondage of demon possession. Today, ask yourself, is there some dark spirit torturing me, driving me, controlling me? If so, come to Jesus. He'll set you free. I'm Jamie Buckingham, Shalom from Israel. Those who work with alcoholics and drug addicts have learned a profound truth about human nature. Help for your condition is not available until you are desperate enough to cry out for help. To want healing so badly, you will do anything for it. As a pastor, I learned early in my ministry that it seldom does any good to call people and offer to help them. You have to wait until they call you. And even then, they have to be desperate, willing to give up everything to receive what they need. I remember Billy Graham's answer to actor Donald O'Connor, who said to him, but I'll die if I can't have a cigarette. Then die, the evangelist answered. That's the same principle Jesus had in mind when he told the story of a woman who wanted a pearl so badly she sold everything to purchase it. In this video, I want to introduce you to the power that's available to desperate people. Come with me to the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus was touched one day by a desperate woman. Have you ever wondered what kind of clothes Jesus wore? The New Testament makes it clear that Jesus, besides wearing the normal clothes of the day, like all other observant Jews of the first century, wore phylacteries when he went to pray in the temple or the synagogue. Today, at the Western Wall, as well as in the synagogues and temples, Orthodox Jews still wrap the phylacteries around their arms and bind them on their foreheads. These small leather capsules contain tiny slips of parchment inscribed with scriptural passages. The one on the arm consists of one compartment, while the head phylactery is divided into four compartments. 
each of which contains a parchment of scripture. Wearing the phylactery was an observance of the commandment in Deuteronomy 6 to bind the commands of the Lord on your arm and on your forehead. Although Jesus wore these when he entered the temple or synagogue, he was highly critical of Jews who wore them hypocritically. He specifically criticized those who make their phylacteries wide, showing off their spirituality. Jesus also wore a prayer shawl called a talit. In fact, Jesus wore two garments above his undergarments. One was a long tunic called a haluk. It was a light robe, usually made of linen. The one Jesus wore was of unusual design since it was seamless, cut from one piece of cloth and bunched together around the waist with a belt. The upper garment, the mantle, which was draped over the tunic, was a heavy shawl, usually made of wool. Unlike the modern-day Jewish prayer shawl, which is only worn during prayer, the talit was worn whenever a Jewish man went outside. It was these two garments that Jesus was referring to in his Sermon on the Mount when he said, if someone wants to sue you for his robe, your haluk, let him have your shawl, your talit, as well. Today, at the Western Wall, as well as in synagogues and temples, Orthodox Jews of all kinds, businessmen, soldiers, rabbis, always wrap themselves in their prayer shawls before praying. The shawl is embroidered with 613 tassels around the fringe, one tassel for each of the laws of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Thus, the Jew, when he puts on the prayer shawl, is actually enclosing or wrapping himself in the Torah, the law of Moses. Modern prayer shawls come in varied lengths and colors. The prayer shawls of the rabbis are usually much larger than this one, covering the head as well as the shoulders. When the Orthodox Jew puts on the prayer shawl, he kisses the helm, showing his devotion to Torah, and then wraps himself in it before putting himself in the law of God. In Jesus' day, the outer garment or prayer shawls were not so elaborate. They were not worn as prayer shawls, but as an outer garment. However, the tassels were worn, according to Numbers 15, 39, to help the wearer recall all the commandments of the law. In Matthew 25, Jesus criticized those who wore long tassels, just as he criticized those who wore elaborate phylacteries to show off their piousness. One day, Jesus was walking near where I am today, near the shore of the Sea of Galilee. A huge crowd had thronged around him, pushing and shoving. A woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years pushed her way through the crowd and came up to him and touched what the Bible calls the hem of his garment. Actually, what she touched was one of these sacred tassels from the prayer show. Immediately, the Bible says, her bleeding stopped and she felt something happen in her body. She knew that she had been healed. Jesus turned. He knew that power had gone from him. Who touched my clothes, he asked. The disciples couldn't believe it. Scores of people are touching you, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus knew that the person who had touched the tassel of his shawl had touched with more than her hands. She had touched with her heart. And then the woman, trembling with fear, fell at his feet, told him all that had happened. It was a critical moment in her life. The Levitical law said that a woman was ceremonially unclean during her menstrual period. Not only could she not be touched by a man, she could not enter the temple to worship. This woman had been menstruating for 12 years. For 12 years, she had been ceremonially unclean, not allowed in the temple, not allowed in the synagogues, which was the equivalent of being separated from God. And yet somehow, she knew that Jesus would not only heal her, he would understand. Reaching down, Jesus helped her to her feet. And then he spoke gently and said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering today. If you're sick, if you're hurting, if you need help, don't be afraid to reach out in prayer and touch the hem of Jesus' garment. He's still healing those who touch him with their hearts.
I'm Jamie Buckingham. Shalom from Israel. There is a powerful spiritual truth that many people either overlook or are afraid to use. Here it is. There is power in the spoken word. The Bible not only says you are what you think, but emphasizes you shall have what you speak. There's been a lot of emphasis on this in recent years among people who teach faith as a way of life. We've called the concept by funny titles, name it and claim it, or blab it and grab it. But I've learned through personal experience that despite the extremes, this is a basic biblical truth. We can have what we say as long as we say what God has already said in the Bible. God wants us to take authority over evil the same way Jesus took authority by receiving the power of the Holy Spirit and then speaking in that power as one under authority. Jesus had no trouble giving orders to evil spirits, nor should we. In this video, I want to take you to a place near old Capernaum. I'm standing on the summit of Mount Arbel, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus took authority over demons. The Sea of Galilee. It was here Jesus began his public ministry. Time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. It was down there near Capernaum on the north shore that Jesus called his first disciples. They were fishermen. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother casting a net into the lake. They were fishermen. Come, he said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And at once, the scripture says, they left their nets and followed him. Galilee. You can't say the name without thinking peace. Yet Galilee, while appearing peaceful on the surface, was a war zone of demonic activity. Just as underneath the surface of this tranquil lake, there live millions of creatures invisible to the naked eye, fish and crustaceans, so swarming throughout this entire region of Galilee, invisible to the human eye, and yet very real, were countless demonic beings, many of whom had taken up residence in the people who lived here. Over on the other side, just across the lake, are the Golan Heights. That area has long been a war zone. During the Six-Day War in 1967, Israelis recaptured that area, which had formerly been occupied by the Syrians. Shortly afterwards, they annexed it as part of the nation of Israel. It was a necessary move for national security. Just to the south is the ancient region of Gadara, where Jesus had his encounter with a demon-possessed man in a cemetery late one night. There, a man living in the old tombs came charging out of the cemetery, screaming and waving his arms. Just the presence of Jesus infuriated the demons that were in him. In fact, it seems every place Jesus traveled in those early days, moving from one small town around the shore of this lake to another, he encountered demons. His first ministry was to a little town surrounding this beautiful lake. In Capernaum, he taught in the synagogue. His teaching did two things. It gave the people a new awareness of the kingdom of God. For the first time, they began to understand that God was not a policeman, a bully, a stern judge. He is a loving, heavenly Father who has a plan and a purpose for each life. But his teaching, his miracles, just his presence did something else. It stirred up these demons who operated in the unseen world, the world Jesus was totally familiar with. Whenever Jesus came into a place where the demons lived, whenever he approached a man or a woman where demons had taken residence, it had the same effect as a man poking a stick into a hornet's nest. The, the demons went crazy. That happened in the synagogue in Capernaum. It was a Saturday morning, and Jesus was there to teach. This is the way Mark tells the story. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one having authority not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by evil spirits cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? 
have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of Israel. Although the people on earth were slow recognizing Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah, God's anointed one, the demons recognized him instantly. They knew him from heaven, where they had lived with their leader Lucifer before they had been cast out, following what Isaiah calls a war in heaven. Lucifer, one of the three archangels, the other two being Michael and Gabriel, had led a rebellion long before man was placed on earth. God's judgment was swift. He banished Lucifer, later known as Satan, and all of his following angels down here to earth. Those banished angels, separated from the presence of God, took on the dark and evil characteristics of Lucifer and became known as demons, devils, evil spirits. When Jesus appeared in their midst on earth, they were anguished and often caused the men and women in whom they were living to act violently, just as they still do. In this case, Jesus ordered the evil spirit to come out of the man. The man began to shake violently and screech, and yet was instantly set free. The people in the synagogue were amazed. What's this? He even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. Throughout his ministry on earth, Jesus took authority over demons. Just a few days before he ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, I'm going to give you the same power over demons that I have, but you will receive power, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. What hope? We're not subject to evil spirits. They are subject to us today. As you walk out into a world very similar to the world in which Jesus lived, where the demons of the unseen world radically affect those of us who live in the seen world, remember, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you have full authority over every evil spirit. Walk in that victory. I'm Jamie Buckingham, Shalom from Israel. As we close out this series on how to use spiritual authority, I want to take you to one of my most favorite spots on all the earth, the area surrounding the Sea of Galilee. Here, late one evening, Jesus performed one of the most exciting miracles ever recorded. A huge crowd of people, numbering up to 15,000, had thronged around him. They were so eager for spiritual food, they forgot it was time to eat. And now the sun was setting, and they were far from home. To feed them seemed impossible. All of us at one time or another have been faced with impossible situations. When the angel told young Mary that she was going to have a baby, she replied, but that's impossible. I'm a virgin. Nothing is impossible with God, the angel answered. A better translation is, no word from God is without power. When God speaks, the impossible fades into nothingness. Let me take you now to the Galilee, where Jesus put that into practice. One of my most thrilling experiences in life was my first glimpse of the Sea of Galilee. It was in the villages surrounding the sea and in the surrounding hills where Jesus' teaching and ministry took place. These are the waters which, though raging in a fierce night storm, were quieted at his command. He walked on them. He commanded Peter to walk on them. Down there, he sat on the bow of a fishing boat while the crowds pressed right in against the water's edge, eager to listen as he taught. In these beautiful hills, he found people in great need and touched them with healing, lepers, 
dying children, the blind and deaf, the crippled and broken. He healed them all. There's an awesome sense of beauty and peace here that defies logic, especially in these politically troubled times. Across the sea to the east can be seen the Golan Heights. Joining them to the south are the mountains of Gilead, through which the Jordan River flows. It's a quiet, peaceful place. But it wasn't quiet that evening when Jesus came here in the spring of the year before he was crucified. It was the week before Passover, and thousands of pilgrims from the north were moving south through this area towards Jerusalem. They thronged around Jesus, listening to his teaching, amazed as he laid hands on the sick, and they were instantly healed. It was a, it was a critical time in his life. Word had just come that King Herod had executed John the Baptist. Jesus expected the people to react against John's execution, which would bring swift reprisals from the Roman overlords. The Romans would probably blame him as an insurrectionist. It'd be a good idea to withdraw until the clamor died down. Jesus knew the crowds would try to cast him in the role of some kind of militant messiah. The nation was on the brink of revolution against Rome. In fact, right over there is Mount Arbel towering over the western shore of the Sea of Galilee above Tiberias. On the northern cliffs of the mountain, visible from below, are the fascinating cave fortresses of the Zealots. In fact, one of Jesus' disciples, Simon the Zealot, had belonged to this group of highly militant Jews. Yesterday, I scaled down the side of that mountain just to see the cliff dwellings where Simon once lived. I was impressed again how rugged and strong these followers of Jesus had been. No sissies, these men. Jesus had been teaching in Capernaum, about two miles from where I'm standing, when word came that John had been killed. He got in a boat, sailed around to this spot uh, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. A huge crowd of people, more than 5,000, rushed along the shoreline, met him when he landed. It must have been frustrating never finding time to be alone. Yet the people were hungry for God, and Jesus had compassion on them. As evening fell, Jesus turned to Philip, one of his disciples, and said with a twinkle in his eye, looks like we're going to have to feed this bunch. Philip, Philip must have turned pale. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, came from the nearby town of Bethsaida. Since they were close to their hometown, they thought Jesus meant to go to town and buy food. We can't feed 5,000 people, Philip blurted out. Jesus, however, had something else in mind. Andrew, who was also a native of Bethsaida, had overheard Jesus' question to Philip, and he stepped forward, had a little boy in tow. The boy had his picnic lunch with him, five barley loaves and two small sardine-sized fish. Will this help? The little kid asked. It was all Jesus needed. While Philip had no faith at all, Andrew and the little boy were at least willing to try. It illustrates a basic spiritual principle. If you'll just work with what you have, if you'll just offer to God what little bit you have, God will do the multiplication. Taking the bread, Jesus blessed it with an ancient Jewish grace over meals. It's the same blessing modern Jewish families often use when they bless the food on Shabbat. Blessed art thou, Jehovah our God, King of the universe, who causes to come forth bread from the earth. Take it and distribute it, Jesus told his disciples. Nobody really knows where the miracle took place, in the blessing, in the distribution, in the eating. But suddenly there was enough food to feed all 5,000 people. When the people had eaten their fill, the disciples passed among them with their kafinos, their large baskets that they slung from their shoulders. Each basket was filled with leftovers. What a wonderful story. The lesson is strong and to the point. Today, on this third Sunday of Lent, are you willing to give to God what little you have and let him multiply it to bless others?